All right, so welcome back to Bible study. We are in the readings for Pentecost 4. So that's Job chapter 38, 1 through 11, Psalm 107, <coughs> verse 1 through 3, and verse 23 through 32, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 through 13, and Mark chapter 4, 35 through 41. So this, uh, we'll begin with our prayer. O God of creation, eternal majesty, you preside over land and sea, sunshine and storm. By your strength, pilot us. By your power, preserve us. By your wisdom, instruct us. And by your hand, protect us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. So there's probably going to be some background noises on this recording. Uh, there's the, uh, our second week of Camp Hope is happening right now. And uh, they're playing their games in the room right next to us. So you'll, uh, we'll all hear some of the, the shouts and the, the, but I'm glad they're here, glad they're having fun. So, but we'll go ahead and dig into, and some very interesting, I think some really, really interesting Bible passages. Um, the, the key passage is, of course, uh, the classic, pretty well-known story from Mark's gospel. It's actually in Mark, Matthew, Luke, and I think, might even be in John. I'd have to double check about that for sure. But definitely it's in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And it's Jesus calms the storm. And uh, then the other Bible readings kind of mention water or the sea, kind of like have some of that, but not Corinthians because it's just, we're just going through Corinthians. So it's, um, it's kind of on its own, but at any rate, uh, we'll go ahead and start with the order that we have them from the um, Sunday lesson, Sunday readings. So let's go ahead and start with um, Job 38. And this time, John, will go, okay. how we go this direction. What, uh, 38, 1 through 38, 11. 38, 1 through 11, yes. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now pre prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were, were his foundation, or its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut in the seas with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set the bars and doors, when I said, this far you may come, but no further, and here your proud waves must stop. Yeah, so, um, so first of all, this is an interesting thing that they drop us into the book of Job in chapter 38. And uh, that's, it's a pivotal transition, uh, the, you know, just to really shorten it. Job is someone who had all kinds of, uh, everything was good in his life, wonderful family, prosperity, plenty of uh, lands and the animals and whatnot. And then uh, the devil says, well, yeah, of course he, Job is faithful because he's everything so good just let me try testing him let's see if he'll be so faithful and God says okay go ahead uh, that's the that's the beginning and then he loses everything I mean he loses family I mean it's just like his life is destroyed um, and then some friends come and sit with him and um, for this the friends the three friends sit with him for seven days and don't say anything and in Stephen ministry which we like to emphasize about being present and being listeners is very important about what Stephen ministry is about, uh, that one-to-one -one Christian caregiving. So we say at first, Job's friends did excellent caregiving. They were just with him. They were just letting him, you know, express his emotions and things like that. But then one by one, they start to tell Job how Job must be responsible for all this tragedy in his life. Like he must have done, you must have done something, Job, to deserve this, you know, horrible punishment in your life. And then Job keeps protesting, no, I, you know, I didn't, I'm righteous, I'm, and um, so anyway, many, many chapters go on like that. And then um, finally Job says, well, 
Oh, the other thing is there's that phrase, I always smile a little, the patience of Job. Job <laughs> fights, he's not, I wouldn't call him patient. If you read the, the whole book of Job, he's like, he's like, no, he's, he's very um, determined to prove his innocence. And so I wouldn't, again, it's, I wouldn't call it exactly patient. And then finally, after uh, he's kind of like, you know what, three friends, you haven't helped me of one little bit. He's like, I'm taking my case to God. This is it. I'm, you know, I'm going to the higher court. Go to the higher court. And so he calls upon um, God to, you know, answer him, talk with him. And this 38 is where God shows up. So God starts to respond. And a lot of what God says is very about, like, were you here when I made this? Were you here when I made this? Were you here when I made this? It's very uh, creation-focused. And in a way, it's almost like after you read it all, it's like, was that an answer? I'm not sure. Uh, but if anything, it's a little bit about how there's just so much amazement in this world and things that can, can, we cannot see at all. So how can we know that? Um, but but while, while it is kind of putting us as humans in our place and the bigness of the creation, uh, I think there's still comfort in the fact that God does take Job seriously. God actually does come and God does respond and God is there. So again, um, it might not be getting the answer that perhaps Job was hoping for, but just that God is with him and God does take him, you know, that God is present. So, um, and it's kind of the reminder that in this life, we're not gonna understand everything. There's so much. Uh, to this to this world but here's the the beginning of the answer and it's uh, again it's creation focused and the other thing that kind of to me puts it um, in perspective is how does God show up God answers Job out of the whirlwind like like you know like a I don't know if we're not as maybe as huge as a tornado but still it's kind of like a another force of which we don't control like we don't control tornadoes. We don't control whirlwinds. We don't, you know. So it's another way of saying, you know, okay, I'm the creator. You're the creation. Uh, you know, who, who, who actually is in control? Um, and uh, I also smile a little bit like, like okay, who's, br who's bringing up these questions here? And then it says, in my version, the revised air version says, gird up your loins like a man. And I like to think of that. Okay, Job, put on your big boy pants, you know. Uh, get get ready here. Get ready here. Um, I, if, you know you wanted me to show up. Okay, this take this seriously, right? Um, then it starts again. It's very creation focused, and it sort of talks about the um, the land portion of that, uh, kind of as if God is an architect and laying a foundation and laying pillars and putting in a cornerstone. So it's a very architect kind of imagery that's used as God uh, creates the, the basic basics of the land. And then it goes into the water uh, side of things. Um, if I think uh, that's what the water side is that we have um, in the Bible, especially starting in the very, very, very beginning, Genesis chapter one, it's uh, the way it's described, creation is described, is in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and then God looks over, let me see, I'm just trying to get there real quick, so I'm saying it correctly. So uh, chapter one, Genesis verse one and two, come on. <laughs> I should have already marked this in here, so I should have done. All right, very close, very close. Okay, so in, you know in Genesis chapter one, also God is kind of like a grand architect. God is um, you know, putting things here, putting things here, putting things in order. Uh, but, but the way it starts out though is things are kind of in chaos. Things are kind of nebulous. Things are very unshaped, unshaped, right? So the way it's described, Genesis 1, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And then um, the way Genesis 1 it goes on is it's almost as if God pushes back the waters. It's almost like water is almost everywhere kind of. And then in order for there to be space for life, God actually pushes the waters back to, to start making space for life. 
Uh, it's interesting though, just this is kind of an aside, but then Genesis 2, which was written at a very different time and it's a different perspective, tells about creation in a little di some different ways. Um, it's almost more like it's dry and now we need water. So it's kind of one is like, we got too much water, let's push it back, let's make land. And then, then Genesis 2 is like, well, we, we have water, but you know, if there's going to be life, I mean, we have land, but if there's going to be life, we need water, you know, so. They, but water in a lot of the Old Testament also could represent chaos, even evil. Sometimes it was used as a symbol for evil. Um, but the way it's treated here in, in um, Job is I wouldn't say, I think it's still that sense of a force that is um, somewhat chaotic. The, you know, the sea is sometimes chaotic, uh, but yet it's also under God's control. And that's also Genesis 1. Like I say, God puts it in certain places. God does put certain control. Um, but here, this is one of the things that I have to admit. I gotta give, I gotta give credit to Fred Gazer, if I say his name right. Uh, he was a professor of Luther Seminary for Old Testament. And he brought to my attention um, a, some a aspect which is like, I didn't see that, but I think that's it's true. So where it says about the water. So God sets up the land issue. Then verse uh, 8, Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no farther, and there shall your proud waves be stopped. But when it burst forth from the womb, when I made clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, is like God is like a midwife to the birth of the sea. I was like, that is wild. That is a really, really intriguing. So we have architect God and we have midwife God. We have two very different um, images of God at work in creation. And um, and so like this this baby is born, but this, sometimes babies are born and they're crying and they're they're you know they're pretty out of control sort of in their own way. And so uh, swaddling, you know, you swaddle the child and only this is with like clouds, God's swaddling it, but, but then um, puts it in place again. So infants can be, um, again, demanding, a bit unruly, but then to keep everybody safe, you put them in a crib, right? So that's kind of the way I kind of like to keep in the line of the imagery of the birth of the seed and God kind of puts it in, puts it like you put a child in a crib you, God puts some limits to how far the sea can go. Um, so, but you know, we do know sometimes it, it goes like bad storms, like um, typhoons and things. I mean, sometimes there are things that do but definitely still limits. It only goes so far. But it still only goes so. It still has a limit. That was what I was thinking. Is there definitely still are limits, and so that's the good news. Um, I guess that's the reminder that. Yes, there are things that are chaos or even evil still in this world, but even so, there are limits. It doesn't go to the fullest extent it could. So that, that's kind of an answer to, to Job, to in his predicament, saying, you know, yes, you faced great despair and great uh, loss, but even so, there's limit. there were limits. Um, and in the end, God, all that Job can kind of reply is like, I'm in awe of you, God. I, you know, he doesn't really, he just kind of accepts. He just kind of is like, I think, again, he is comforted simply that God is there and God is speaking to him and God is it, being with him. That is already just kind of enough that he's, he knows God is with him. So, so the water image is a crossover to, to the um, gospel. Now the psalm also crosses over to the gospel very strongly. So that's Psalm 107. And this one, um, let's, we'll hear, if you have your Bible and you can go to Psalm 107, I think I'd like us to as much as you can. If, before we go into that, even in Job there was a limit. When it started, the devil was going to do this, but he said, but you can't kill him. Yeah, that's true. God said, but one yeah. limit, you cannot kill him at least, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and keep in mind, in a way, that the whole thing of Job, in a way, in its own self, is sort of a parable, like a really huge parable, trying to deal with, uh, you know, why is there, why do bad things happen, kind of. Um, there was, 
Also, wait, let me read this one quote. So Dan Simonson, who wrote a book about um, facing suffering, he's, in his book he says, Job is advised to recognize human limits and trust that God will take care of what Job and others cannot know or do. So we can try to do what we can, but then put our trust in God for the things that truly are beyond our, that are beyond our control. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, so, so Psalm 107 is, uh, fits to the theme of the gospel reading too. It's a psalm about people facing trouble and how God has been there for them when they faced various kinds of trouble. And there are multiple situations of trouble that are included in the psalm, but we hear the very beginning and then we skip over to the part that has to do with water again, because we're kind of keeping on the theme with the water stuff. So, um, Barb, do you have that? Just read the portion that we heard from churches. Is, is that good? Yeah, like 1 to 3 and then 23 to 32. Yeah, thank you. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, for God's mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the hand of the foe, gathering them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some went down to the sea in ships, flying their trade in deep waters. They beheld the work of the Lord, God's wonderful works in the deep. Then God spoke, <clears throat> excuse me, and a stormy wind arose, which tossed high the waves of the sea. They mounted up to the heavens and descended to the depths. Their souls melted away in their peril. They staggered and reeled like drunkards, and all their skill was of no avail. Then in their trouble they cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. You still the storm to a whisper and silenced the waves of the sea. Then then were they glad when it grew calm and you guided them to the harbor they desired. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. Thank you. Let them exalt oh. you in the assembly of the people. In the council of the elders, let them sing hallelujah. Yes, all right, thanks. Um, so, so some of the other situations before we get to the uh, peril on the sea, uh, there were one of them which actually, ironically for our living situation, we could have perhaps, it was being in the desert and uh, being thirsty. <laughs> so that might um, point towards the exodus you know so even though it's just talking about any situation when you're in the desert and you didn't have enough and then and then you turn to God and then God helped make sure you you know survived and everything um, so that so it might be the exodus and then there's one about being prisoners and then um, bowed down with with hard labor and things like that and then again turning to the Lord and God helps, crying to the Lord, God helps them and rescues them from this captivity. And then that might be the Babylonian captivity. But again, it could be any situation where, you know, they certainly fought many wars over many years and, you know, people were taken captive. So it, it doesn't have to be the Babylonian exile, but, you know, maybe it is. And then another one is just a, a broad one. And it could be, again, of many other possible occasions, but you were sick. You were so, so very sick. And then, um, again, calling to God. This one is um, actually more than an individual. It says they were sick. Uh, they, you know, so I don't know, again, if, it was, if it's supposed to make us recall a certain Bible story. I'm not sure. But at any rate, uh, again, they call to the Lord. And again, God helps you know save them so each each time there's a terrible predicament they cry to God God helps them God rescues them and then we get to the episode where they're on the water um, one thing about the Israelites is that you know yes they did fishing on the like Sea of Galilee and maybe some you know a bit of fishing at the Mediterranean but they were not a seafaring nation that was not you know the Phoenicians there were other um, nations that were very much about you know going out to the water and going out on the ocean or the 
Mediterranean um, was very much a part of who they were, but mostly they were people on land. So um, I find it interesting that it does include this story about um, being in on the water and being in a terrible storm. You know, I mean, the, I have to say one thing about the Psalms, which I find I, I just enjoy, is they are poetry. And so sometimes I think they liked, there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of running around in the games and everything. Um, they, they, they are very vivid, the imagery. They use, it uses some really vivid imagery. I mean, it's like, so they're, so they're lifted up on the waves. They mounted up to the heavens. So, you know, if you've ever seen, I've never thankfully experienced it, but if you've ever seen like movies where like the waves make these huge troughs. And so at one moment, the ship is way up on the top and then it's like, boom, and then they're in the bottom. And it's like, that's the, that's the description. And, it, and that movement is so, so much, so strong. It says they're like, you know, trying to stand and they can't, they can't keep their balance. And I mean, the, the descriptiveness of it is, it creates such a picture in your mind. So this is like what they are, are experiencing is a severe, severe, severe storm. I've um, never been, I've been on little boats, um, sort of bigger, like go out to do like fishing on ocean, ocean fishing event type you go. Yeah, like a fishing thing. Yeah, deep sea fishing. Um, that's a little bigger. And sometimes I, that's, one, that's the one that actually gets to me. I'm usually pretty, I'll call it seaworthy, don't usually get, you know, seasick, but that particular level of boat for some reason, and the movement is sort of like, oh, I'm feeling this. Um, and I've only been on a few, few um, like, actual ships, right? And those are big, they don't move as much. They, that one doesn't seem to get to me because they're, they're big and they're more sturdy and everything. Uh, yeah. In a star, there's I, I can relate. To you that. can you can you can relate to yes. the image. <laughs> uh, and this would have been in the '70s. Uh -huh. and I, there was twice, but the first one was in the '70s, and that's what I'll talk about. <clears throat> we're coming, uh, Patricia and I, uh, we're coming from uh, on the ferry from uh, Calais to Dover, mm -hmm. and there was a violent storm in the Channel. Ooh. And yeah. as it turned out, we were the last ship. That left. Calais. After that, they didn't let anybody they leave. They shut the... everything down. Okay. <laughs> and so, I'm I'm sitting up on the uh, about the third deck where mm -hmm. the where the uh, uh, food and stuff is, mm -hmm. and I'm looking out the front, and every one by one, the, the, the bottle will go up like this, and boom, and the water. Come I can up. see it go like this. Yeah, it looked like a storm in the North Atlantic. <laughs> And the uh, wow. you know, one by one, people were leaving, going down, getting sick, and doing everything else. Yeah, and I was the last one left on deck, and I would I'd sit, I had my pint of beer, and I'd, <laughs> and I'd go over here, and I'd catch it over. Oh, there. oh, it would slide, you catch it, it would slide. That's funny. And then we made, uh, they closed the port of uh, Dover. We we're the last ship in mm. Dover. Before they shut the it was a yeah, violent, but, so it was violent. so bad. Nobody else was going. They weren't going to let anyone out and in when there. And got back down to, to get the. You know, Look at you! You were in the, it. The coach Ooh. and stuff like that. There was yeah. everything was all just, over the inside. Just of the, thrown around. You know, yeah. Thrown wow. Around. It was really, wow. really violent. You know, the other time was in the, uh, the crossing uh, uh, between. Uh, uh, you know, around Cape Horn, going down to Antarctica, through that. I've heard that's pole. one of the roughest. That was this, it sea. is very rough. Yeah. There was no storm, but oh. it was like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> like Pastor Dave. You couldn't stand up. You had to kind yeah. Of, yeah. I've no. I don't. I'm not sure. I have the desire to go to Antarctica because Pastor Dave's uh, parents had traveled there themselves too, and they they were you know they traveled a lot, so they were they were pretty you know stable with flying and ships and all this stuff. And that was one of the only ones that they ever also told us that they felt the seasickness. Like that was so, so rough that that yeah. even got to it them. It wasn't a storm. So, it just normal. Yeah. That's the normal. Yeah, that area of the world, the waters are it's just very rough. So, yeah, so I've, I've learned like that's not on my bucket list. <laughs> so, so um, it also makes me um, think a little bit of the story of Jonah because in that story, the waters get so rough that the sailors are like, who offended their God that we are in the midst of this storm? And then um, it becomes clear that Jonah is the guilty party, and they're like, "We're sorry, Jonah, but you know, 
bye, you're going overboard, you know. And then, of course, the key gets swallowed. That, that's a whole other story. But uh, so, so this, what's interesting, though, is I think um, a big point about this is, and again, this is throughout other parts of the Old Testament, is who can, who can control the sea? That's, we cannot, but maybe, but God can. God set the limits, and God can actually do, can control, and the weather, too. Like, we can't control the weather. So, yeah. I was, I was um, once in ND6, a friend of mine, we were in, in Cancun, we were way out, and it was clear, glass was snorkeling, all of a sudden, the sky got dark, we were in the water, and it started going like this, Oy. and everything, and yes, and my friend, who was with, she turns to me and tells me that she doesn't know how to swim. <gasps> what? No! So I had, I, mean, I literally had to, um, I had to, first, I had, I had to control her, and we had snorkeling equipment on, so I had to literally, I had to grab her, and you know, flip her, hold her by the neck, just to get her to stop grabbing my neck. And and um, and I had to get the flippers off of me and throw the stuff around. And you know, we find and it's just. I mean, it's just all of a sudden that you realize that. I mean, you have no control over nature. Yeah. And you just go with yeah. it. And there was the guy on. We were on a private boat and we rented it snorkeling. And he's, of course, he couldn't leave the boat because mm -hmm. it would have taken off. So the he, boat, we, yeah. yeah the boat would be gone. Would, and now what would you do? <laughs> yeah, really. So, um, so I just, you know, grabbed her, and I'm a good swimmer, and I sideways, I swam over, and he pulled us in. And it wow. Was, yeah. Thank the Lord, you, you, you and, could do what was yeah, right to get but there. I realized that like, yeah, you, I mean, you cannot, you, you can't control. You are at the mercy. Yeah. You yeah. can't control. Yeah. You just gotta go with it. So, so this is the, I think that's the point of this uh, portion that's we have here. You, you don't have control, so what else? You know, they were, again, they, assuming these were people who could do everything they already could do, they'd already done all that, uh, then they're like, Lord, help, Lord, help, please yeah. save us, and then God saves them. And um, so actually, I think because we, to keep this fresh in mind, let's jump over to the gospel first because it connects very strongly, I think, very strongly with this psalm. So let's go to, um, let's see, Jeannie, I guess I'll ask if you'll be the reader of Mark uh, 4 and 35 through 41. 35 through 41. Yeah. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jarius. The synagogue. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Are we in Mark? Yes. Oh, Am I in the wrong story? I don't know. Four? Chapter four? four? Oh, I'm in five. I'm sorry. That's okay. okay. I think that's a different story we'll get to another time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so four and then 35 through 41. Okay. <coughs> okay. Jesus comes to storm. That makes more sense. Mm. Yes. <laughs> that day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves <coughs> broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And how far am I going? Keep, keep going. Uh, to the end of the chapter. Okay. He said, Yes. They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So I find, um, again, even though this is a story that is in each of the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, yet each gospel places it sometimes in their own particular position. That's kind of what happens. Sometimes we have the same thing happens in each of the gospels, but it's like, but where did they put that episode? Where did they, what's, what's the context? And in, in Mark's gospel, the context is that uh, Jesus has been teaching a long, full day of teaching, and... Um, that that's a lot of work really but even so at the end of the day he says we need to go over to the other side of the lake i you know um and i i interpret contextually why is jesus motivated to be like why not go in the morning you know why not just you know cook your food have a nice nice sleep and 
set off in the morning. You know, what, what's the big rush? We gotta, we gotta get going right now. And even though it's gonna be dark and who wants to be out, you know, navigating the water in the dark? Although I suppose they, know, they knew their stars, they, they would know, but still. Um, it's just like most any time travel. I'd much rather, rather travel personally in the daytime than in the nighttime. Um, we went to, it was a lot of fun, but we went to a trip with our youth to Disneyland last October. But in order to get there in good time, we had to leave like at four in the morning. And I realized driving to California a, a long, 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 long time, we were in the dark. And I was like, ooh, I, you know, I mean, we had to do it that way. But once the sun was coming up, I was like, oh, it's so much better. I so much appreciate it. I could see more of what everything is and all that. So the idea that they would set out traveling at, at night, you know, it's a little odd. Um, but why would he be having any sense of urgency? Well, I don't think we're going to hear this in the, or at least not yet, in our readings in church. But chapter 5 starts out, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And this is not Jewish territory, by the way. Um, and he stepped out of the boat. Immediately, a man out of the tomb with an unclean, unclean spirit met him. And then it goes on to tell him how this man was so tortured by many, many demons. And he, he was, I mean, his, his, he had, talk about not having control in one's life. He had no control. He was hurting himself. He was, I mean, he was a person who was struggling to live in, in like every way. So, you know, I wonder, at least the way Mark lines this up, this, you know, the timing, was Jesus motivated, like, we got to get there, because maybe he was wanting to reach this man, you know. So, at least in Mark's way of telling it, I think that's what is part of the reason why he goes there. Um, but in the meantime, Jesus was working hard all day, and they get in the boat, and he's like, okay. I got some fishermen here. They know they're sailing. I'll just go take a nap, you know. So he goes and curls up at the front of the boat with the pillow, and he's just snoozing away. Um, and the uh, apparently this lake, it's a lake, but I think they call it the sea. Did they? How do they? Type? Yeah, the sea. They, they kind of, even though it's really a lake, they kind of play into the idea of calling it a sea as well. Um, and it's well known to actually have squalls. It's, it is a location where, it uh, just like you were describing about being in the ocean, where it seems calm, and then all of a sudden, like, whoa, you know, like the wind hits and, and then waves and everything. So apparently one of those squalls um, kicked up while they were crossing over. And um, again, at least four of the disciples were fishermen. At least four of them were used to being sail sailing and on the water. Um, so it wouldn't be like they'd be, if it was a little thing, they'd be like, oh, here's what we do, you know. We turn the boat this way, we, we do this with the sails, you know, like they'd, they'd have their strategy, but it was more, it was more than they could even, you know, do things to handle it. So finally, um, and it says, it was so big that the waves were coming into the boat, and then they were prob probably like, eh, we can't bail the water up fast enough, you know. So finally, they're like, they're, they are so scared and everything. Um, they look over at Jesus and they're like, <laughs> I don't know honestly what their thoughts are. Um, because what they do, this is their phrase. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Don't you care that we're going to die? You know, um, and, Jesus, and the other thing I have to admit, too, is like, okay, was Jesus' confidence in God so strong that he knew they weren't going to sink, so he could just sleep away through the, all of this, but the other side of me is like, how, come he, how could he even still be sleeping, you know? <laughs> like, how could it be like they had to actually wake him up? Because I'm like, I would think that would kind of wake you up, but I, you know, I don't know. Um, but it's how they call on him. I guess that's a question I wonder about. Uh, but he wakes up. And then he rebukes the wind. He tells the water, peace, be still. And the, the wording is, um, let me see. I don't know if I wrote this down, but I think, I think it's something along the lines of, one of them is, oh, the peace is like, kind of almost like more like shut up or sort of, it's kind of on the verge of that level. My Bible says quiet. Quiet, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's just like, 
quiet. Yeah, I like the quiet. I like that version. Quiet. And then the be still is also similar to where uh, earlier in the gospel, he healed a man who was uh, possessed by a demon. And he, he said some, the wording there was again, something like, or be quiet or something, but it's like be muzzled more literally. It's like, you know, like you have a dog that's barking and too loud. You put a muzzle on him, right? That's, that's more what the phrase is, is like be muzzled. But again, it's a sense of putting in control, like you've, you've overcome that, you know, so they can't do that. So, so again, so the wind and the wave, um, he just simply says, quiet, muzzled, you know, like put back, you know, put in control. And then it's like, now dead calm is not necessarily good because then they're like, dang, now we gotta get out the oars. <laughs> now we gotta row all the way. But um, they take it after that. yeah, at that point they were like, "That's okay. We'll do. We'll t we'll do it. We'll do it with oars. We're okay with that." Um, yeah. So then he does kind of chide them. You know, he says, "Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith?" Um, I would say, on the one hand, this is early in the gospel. They've certainly seen Jesus do some pretty amazing things already. But on the other hand, do they have enough experience yet to have that level of trust? So, so I kind of say, like, is that a fair? question at this point you know but uh, but I also think the reason to, this is my own interpretation I'm not sure it's like the only way but I think it's the way they word their calling to Jesus partly because they don't say help they say don't you care and I think that's there's a I don't know I mean it's a different way maybe it's fear that makes you not say it like make you angry fear can make you angry so maybe that's where the don't you care part comes from. But the psalm kept saying they turn to the Lord, they turn to the Lord, they turn to the Lord, and they cry out like help, and they don't say, Jesus, help us. I guess that's what I feel like that's what would have been a better way of them to turn to Jesus. But aren't they being human? And they're being human, yeah. yeah. And they yeah. Panic. Yeah. Uh, you it's know, panic. You're, you're first, why is this happening? Yeah, you know, oh yeah. Don't, you know, why is this happening to me? But right. you know, they ultimately reach out. Yeah, to, to well, and when we're scared, we might not do the most... Um, I don't know, Brand polite way yeah. of, yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. so yeah. But yeah. I think it's very, they were very, very human. In very that, human, in it that, is, uh, yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, is that, Carol, you're just, just like, yeah. Adrenaline, yeah. The adrenaline, that rush, yeah, you're, that's a good point. The fight, flight, adrenaline, that surge of adrenaline that's going through them at that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, your brain isn't in a clear thinking mode at all. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're very human. And especially since yeah. they've done everything within their power yeah. to, to resolve the issue. Right. They, and, right. and they can't. They're, they're, yeah. I think sometimes, though, I think the question I hear on Jesus' side is a little bit, don't you trust me? You know, that, that's a little bit of what the question is. It's not, it's, it's like, don't, it, the question comes across, you know, why are you afraid? Have you, have you mm -hmm. no faith? But I think behind it all is, don't you trust me? You know, I think there is a, you know, a sense of, art. don't you know me already? Don't you trust me? But again, if our own urgency and our fear and adrenaline's going, right. um, I think it's also understandable that the way they, they just are just so afraid. They're like, Jesus, help. Well, they didn't say help, but they say, do you care? Wake up, help. And, yeah. and he said, calm, basically, calm down, think about it. <laughs> yeah, maybe the wind and the waves being made calm, it was also sort of a message. Maybe he was talking to the wind waves, maybe he was talking to the disciples, like, shh. Be, be still, <laughs> just like he's, he's telling them, like, yeah. you guys calm down. Stop panicking. You, you guys stop panicking, calm down. Of course, that's the other joke about if someone is panicking, like, you tell someone to stop panicking, you're like, yeah, that works real well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't do a thing. Yeah. Makes it worse. falling asleep is, is an illustration of him being fully man and fully God. Mm -hmm. So he's fatigued, like humans get fatigued, and mm -hmm. he's a nap, and, you know, sometimes we just... We so need deeply, it. That yeah. we're not, you know, worried about mm -hmm. what's going on around us, and then it kind of proves your point, or or kind of uh, leads me to believe that perhaps the disciples were, as you mentioned in your sermon, more concerned about, aren't you worried that we're all going to die and you're sleeping? Don't you want to at least be awake and be a part of this? Mm -hmm. Maybe rather than 
expecting him to be able to Actually fix the problem because when he fixes the problem, their response is, who is this guy? I'm they're like, like, yeah, like their eyes saying, are really big. If they're saying, like, yeah. don't you care to do something, believing yeah. that he could, then they wouldn't be so amazed that... Yeah, know, yeah I think maybe they didn't guy? expect that this right. was something even... Je- they'd seen Jesus do healings, they'd seen Jesus do things, but maybe at this point... They didn't even think he could pull this off. Yeah. But yeah, like this was waking him up and asking him to do something. Yeah, that they shouldn't do something. yeah, it was more like Jesus. We just need there. you with us. You got to be awake. Right, That's right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think that, and, and, and so the yeah. point being back with the psalm is then um, let me see if I can get there quickly enough. Oh no, I went to Joe. Let me get to the psalm. So the, then when it talks about when God intervenes and you know how wild a storm. It says, then they cried to the Lord. This is picking up verse 28 of Psalm 107. Is that right? Um, yeah. Um, then it says, then they cried to, to the Lord in, in their trouble. He brought them out of their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet, and he, and he brought them to their safely to their... But just the wording, you know, he made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. And then, you know, basically in, in the gospel, we had, you know, what are the words of Jesus, peace be still. It's almost like, again, the very exact description of this is what God could do, and Jesus does it. So that, that's a big, that is like a big aha moment of this, this episode is that they're kind of saying, wait, all we ever have known is the only, only God could possibly control the weather and the water, and, the, and now Jesus has done this. So yeah, so I think it is that eye opening of like, Jesus, God, <laughs> to, this is, yeah. So so yeah, it's a very uh, revelatory moment, I guess you could say. Theophany is sometimes a word, I mean, God shows up kind of moment. So yeah. Um, I did like to say, and I'll just mention this too, uh, this isn't particularly exactly in this passage, but I think in other places, um, it's a way in which sometimes in life we go through storms, and yeah, sometimes I've I've had moments where it felt like okay, God actually did calm the storm. Like I've I felt like like you cried to God, and then God actually brought the storm down. But I've also had the experience where you cried to God, and the storm itself didn't really stop. But at least inside, I felt at peace. I felt like. God's here. I'm. It'll. I'll be okay. This will be okay. God is here, um, but that didn't change the outward event. But in here, the peace came. So I feel like sometimes the answer to stilling the storm is not that the storm goes away, but just that we have the confidence that God is with us, and that gives it a certain kind of peace, even in the midst, even in the midst of the storm. The and you don't even have to pr- to weather the storm. Yeah. And you don't even have to. Uh, call out because mm-hmm. the helper even if you aren't vo- vocalizing it mm-hmm. knows what you're yeah Romans tells us like the Holy Spirit sometimes can pray on our behalf helps pray on our behalf when we can't even express it ourselves I like that's from Romans 8 yeah I like that too well let's, well, let's at least touch on the uh, Corinthians so Corinthians isn't thematic in this it's just we're going through portions of Corinthians So it's not here because we think, hey, this ties into the gospel. I wouldn't say that necessarily, but we're just getting different passages. Um, I think there is kind of a connection in in this portion of, let's see, so it's um, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians in 6 and 1 through 13. And again, the context is um, Paul is reaching out to the the Christians in Corinth but their, their, their relationship is tense. They're, they're in a difficult um, place. So, um, Carol, would you, can you read that for us? Thank you, okay. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See now, see, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way. 
through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as, impos as impostors, and yet are truly as unknown, and yet and yet are well known as dying and as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. And that, that last uh, couple of phrase there is, um, again, it's, it's very much a, an appeal, you know, uh, to, to them to, to help make reconciliation, bring them back together in their relationship. So, um, and, and you do, you feel there's a certain... Um, like, like it really matters to Paul. You know, he really wants to make a good and restored relationship with this community. Uh, other, other ones like Philippi, the, in the community of Philippi, uh, the, the Thessalonians, like he, he shares his appreciation for the strong bond that he has with those Christian communities. And I think again, he, we never know for sure what he did or said exactly that really created this big rift, mm -hmm. but there's other places that imply he does regret whatever it was, and that he is he really is trying to help make reconciliation. Um, and a part of that is, um, I want to just mention, uh, so this wasn't included in our readings, although I love, this is one of my favorite things too. This is the very end of chapter five, so this is right before he, he says what we just heard. So uh, he says, so we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So even though he's now talking here on a big theological level, then he goes into a more personal level. And it's kind of like just as we, God has been we have been made right with God through Jesus Christ. Um, that's not just only for us and God, that should also apply to our relationships with each other. And so now he's trying to make that bridge. He's trying to help, help make that, restore that relationship. Um, and I guess part of his um, appeal or way he tries to make his um, message is to say, how committed they are, how much they are willing to go through to reach the people with the gospel. Like, um, so it was, it took a lot on their part, obviously, as he mentions there, it took a lot. And one thing I did realize, though, related to the water theme of our other readings, he didn't mention the shipwrecks, but we know from the book of Acts, he did even endure a bad, journeys on the water and even shipwrecks so so he you know he did certainly endure a great deal and he's not just talking about only himself he's talking because because most of the time he did these journeys with companions other people timothy um oh barnabas i don't know i can't write i can't name them all you know but there were different people who were companions with paul at times so it's you know he's not talking just about himself he's he's talking about the others who were uh, with him who were the evangelists too um, so I think he's just trying to point out his sincerity, his commitment, um, how deeply he wants them to really embrace the gospel message. You know, it's kind of like we went to so much to get this message to you. Please don't let it be for nothing. Please don't let it go. You know, like hear that gospel, embrace that gospel, hear that message about being reconciled to God, um, him making him who knew no sin 
so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. You know, his fear is that they could, they, if they would lose that, that would just be the most heartbreaking thing for him. So that's, that's his, that's what he's trying to convey here, I think. Um, so how much um, with God's help they go through. But then I like the part, I have to laugh because I've always felt like about this passage, I was like, here we go, all this bad stuff, bad stuff, bad stuff, bad stuff. Oh, but here we are. Oh, phew. So we have, we have, um, how, how do you get through all this? Well, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, the power of God, with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. You know, so it's sort of like, how in the world did they endure all that? Well, because God gave them these other things. You know, this was the, this was the strength that God gave them, the words or the peace or the, um, the kindness. You know, all of this is how the, how the Spirit empowers them that they could get through all of that other, like, wow, look at all that stuff they went through. Yeah. I'm just curious, I don't know the whole book, but um, so um, were these, the people in Corinth, were they, they were Christians and then Paul said or did something that ticked them off and so now he's Yeah, there, and, and, and the, the Corinth has always been a very complicated Christian community because even in 1 Corinthians, there's also that shows that there were factions like there was this group who had listened to this Christian leader and this group who listened to this Christian leader and this group. So even in the, you know, we think denominations um, already at the very beginning of Christianity, people were like, oh, we're on this person's side and we're on this person's side and we're on this person's side. And the, and the, and the Christians were a small minority yeah. there. There was, a, and was, every, a, there was a, a, every God imaginable uh, mm -hmm. uh, so worshiped yeah. there in that yeah. community. Yeah. 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 And then other leaders came, I think, after Paul. And I think that's the other thing that kind of was really worrisome to him because they seemed to be leaders who, but they, who, who were very more like, look at me. Look at what a great leader I am, you know. And he's like, they're, they're, they're losing the core message of what the gospel is. It's all about Jesus and, and what God has done for us through Jesus. And you know, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ. But again, these other leaders are more like, again, me, 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 me. So, so um, I think he really wanted them to hear. Yeah, yeah, like that never happens before. There's never any Christ Christian leaders who are about like my empire that I've built, you know, for the king, you know, my own, what I've done and everything. So, yeah. Um, anyway, it's, I mean, it's worthwhile. I appreciate hearing that we're in, the second Corinthians, but I honestly don't always have like, oh, and here's the crisscross to the gospel. It's just, it's its own, it's kind of its own thing. But well, we made it, we got there. Uh, let's go ahead, uh, if we can, share with our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And may you have a very blessed week.